So welcome to this month's Deep Adaptation q and I'm Professor Jen Bendel, uh, the founder of the Deep Adaptation Forum, uh, and I host these Q&As every month uh, with someone who I invite to explore different dimensions of deep adaptation, or, or rather explore issues which I think are really important for the deep adaptation community. So today I'm very, very happy to have uh, Professor Henk Barendrecht join us. And uh, I met Henk um, not through academia, but um, when I participated in uh, one of his Vipassana retreats uh, last year, and I discovered the importance of insight meditation um, in, in so many ways. <laughs> um, in, so much so I've reached a point where I think it's really important to anyone who's doing any scholarly work to actually better understand their own mind. So uh, Professor Barendrecht, Henk, it's wonderful that you're joining us today. Um, thank you very much. The pleasure is mutual, mutual. Super. So just a little bit of context, Henk. I, I mean, um, and and for anyone who will be tuning in, in later and watching this. Um, deep adaptation as a concept and framework and now community uh, involves people or invites people to consider um, the breakdown of this way of life as either likely now because of environmental pressures or inevitable or already occurring in some parts of the world, but to not then have that view to then um, sort of turn away from that trouble, but to actually find ways of staying compassionately, creatively, uh, cleverly, <laughs> um, and responsibly engaged in trying to reduce harm. Um, so that's the, the, the framework of deep adaptation, the concept of deep adaptation, and that's the ethos as well of the, the people in, in, in the community. And for many people, it's a, a spiritual, uh, or it has a spiritual dimension to it. Um, because it, when you question um, the society you live in, which is what happens when you begin to look at where we're headed and the damage that we've done and that we are doing, um, it really, really does challenge you to then think about, well, what's important? What, what's what's almost transcendent as well. So I'm really pleased you, you've, you've, you're joining us today to, to share your wisdom um, in, in, in many ways, um, many ways, Hank. So um, to start off with, um, I would love to hear a little bit of background because you were a professor in mathematics and uh, I think neuro psychology uh, at the University of Nai Meijen. I don't know quite how to pronounce it. I was um, a professor of the foundations of mathematics and computer science. Ah, And I was okay. not involved yet with neuro and mind. Okay, that came, came later. later. Can you tell me a little bit about your journey towards them being involved with the work on the mind and, and also your prioritization of of working as a as a as a as a Buddhist teacher and um, a vipassana facilitator, how you moved towards that? When about uh, forty eight years ago, I started to meditate. Not immediately, I started with Zen meditation, and then in California, and then coming back to the Netherlands seven years later, I started to do seriously. Vipassana meditation and after the first retreat I saw the potential of meditation the potential for peace in your own mind peace with others with the world and I thought this is very powerful I would like to devote fully my time to this but then I thought also I started a successful career in mathematical logic. If people see that when you meditate, you stop your career, they will think, nothing for me, it's even dangerous. So I decided 
let me do mathematical logic. Let me keep investigating things. And on the side, I keep meditating for PR reasons. Also because I love mathematics as well. And then 20 years later, I got the Spinoza Prize, which is the highest pr scientific prize in the Netherlands. And then I thought, now I can make the switch. I was 55 then. Now I can make the switch because people will not say that I wasted my time. And then I used part of the money of that price to investigate uh, meditation. Wow, that's really, I, I haven't heard that before. And that's really interesting to hear that you, um, you were conscious of uh, the implications for people around you, I suppose, close to you, but also colleagues and beyond um, about if you just said, wow, meditation's where it's at. I'm just leaving my career completely. You, you wanted to um, retain those connections and that uh, status. It, it sounds like in order to be able to reach out to people, to communicate to people about the benefits of meditation. When you say it's PR, it was so that they wouldn't think that meditation is just about hiding away somewhere. Yes, yes. And also it did help me with doing mathematics. Mm -hmm. With meditation, you can reduce the stress of daily life, even before the climate crisis and other crises, there is stress of daily life that's well known. So mm -hmm. you can concentrate better and your mind becomes more flexible. So it did help me and I got prizes. So worked worked out well. I see. So all these up and coming mathematicians would say, what's his secret? And you would say, meditate. <laughs> yes, you could do also other things to concentrate. Um, even reading a book is already an act of concentration. Mm -hmm. Playing music or listening to music is an act of concentration. Meditation, and in particular Vipassana, goes towards sustainable concentration because it looks deep in us are there hidden fears, are there hidden desires? And those may disturb your daily life so that um, more often you're not in a concentrated mood. Mm. So yes. Vipassana is in depth, sustainable, and the concentration meditation of other types of meditation is the immediate uh, concentration. So, for what what I didn't realize about Vipassana insight meditation before I attended your retreat was that it's really about um, bringing attention to uh, our feeling processes, our and our thought processes. So it was quite different from the kind of meditation I had been told about in practice, which was much about, which was more about just finding, finding peace in the moment and um, uncluttering the mind. So I, I see that now as I remember you talking about basic exercise one, but then moving on to the next, which is to then spot the thoughts like, oh, and label the thought and then notice if it was pleasant or unpleasant thought and then notice if there was craving or aversion towards or about that that thought or it could also be a sensation um, as well and I was wondering is has when you say that meditation has been useful in mathematics has it also do you think helped to observe that when you have an idea um, in mathematics uh, the way you find an idea pleasant or unpleasant and if there's any aversion or craving to to that is there does it build that ability to look at your own thinking as you're engaging in intellectual work yeah this is a refined question um, to start with let me tell you that mathematics uses intuition a lot 
even more than rationality. We all are more or less rational and some professionals a little bit more, but not much more than anybody. But mathematics is so complex that when we want to find a solution to a problem or a proof of a putative mm. theorem, it's way too large to um, think about it in a rational way. We have to follow our intuition. Oh. And with our intuition, we search even unconsciously. And then when we sniff something useful that may sound pleasant, may feel pleasant, then we zoom in. And then rationally, we check it. We do need rationality, that's for sure. But intuition is as important as well. I could give a lecture on mathematics for you, but we, <laughs> we uh, will not change the topic because we may lose some people. Or uh, we d I d can do it another time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, the I am... between rationality and intuition. Yeah, I hadn't heard that said before, and that makes perfect sense because of uh, complexity and how and uh, how the human mind uh, can process complexity. And I think we've probably all had aha moments after leaving a problem, going walking, going cycling, or waking up in the morning, and then aha, you know. So that. That relates to what you've just said. Um, I advise my students, if I may interrupt, to have every day an aha. Um, we say in Dutch, aha erlebnis, according to the German. So an aha experience. Okay. Even a little one, that's fine. And everyone is able by opening a book or to have a little, even going to YouTube to, to uh, Kurz gesagt, in a nutshell, you have your little aha erlebnisses of learning something new. There's so much in life and in the world, even in this state of the world. Yeah, so there's a, the, um, it's this wonder, it's this wonder at, at being alive, this appetite for, for mm. experiencing life. Yeah, so, um, Thank you. So I'm... May I say one more thing about mathematics? Yes. That it is not so much a quantitative science, but more a qualitative science. Mm -hmm. And that's unknown to the general public. So the numbers, it's almost an abuse of mathematics. Uh, we are about qualities. And to make it easy to imagine, do you know what's an equilateral triangle or angles of 60? Uh, I show mm -hmm. my finger. This is an equilateral triangle. Now there's a quality. All the sides are equal. No quantity is involved. I mentioned the degree of 60, the angle, but that's an after fact. Or that the sum of the angles in a triangle is 180. Well, 180 is just a convention. If you cut out of a triangle the three angles when you're in kindergarten and you put them next to each other, they form a straight line. Wow, that's special, that's quality. And that you call it 180. That's, that's a convention. I see, yeah. It's, it's interesting that, I mean, the natural sciences rely on mathematics so much and within that, Field, then obviously the natural sciences that comprise climatology as well mm -hmm. and within climatology computer models which are so based on mathematics um, are talked about as if they um, tell you how reality is and will be and it's really interesting to see that some people who work in the field of climate modeling say uh, no, 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 <laughs> don't, there's, the, the, this, this is a lens, this is a, and, and it's, it's not like some uh, pure truth about the situation, but of course it's difficult then to, to, to have conversations about the climate, climate reality, um, 
in in the public sphere because um, some people want to just say no the model is really accurate and therefore we must act and other people say well actually um, we should look at say the paleo record and it's actually more worrying in terms of what it suggests how current temperatures should become so it's inter interesting to hear from you about about mathematics in that way but but Hank what I'm really interested in is the extent to which for you the philosophy and practice of insight meditation uh, could relate or in your experience already does relate to this field what's now being called eco anxiety or climate anxiety um, and if you have any any thoughts on that yes i prepared something to say about mathematical models um, oh yeah shall we come back to that later it's oh sure. no 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 I, okay. i'm i'm sorry i shouldn't have moved on i would be happy to hear your thoughts on on climate models and oh mathematical models in general yeah models are models and in some cases the world fits very accurately on it and in other cases they fit in less accurately on it so there are climate scepticist or skepticist or scepticist uh, you know what i mean they mm. say it's not sure that um, the disaster will happen to us because it's a model and then the model is not linear and the predictability is not 100 percent you know that argument mm. however that's the wrong remark we should not ask, is it sure that there will be a disaster coming? We should ask, is it sure that there will be not a disaster coming? Because if I make a bridge, if I'm an engineering company and I make a bridge, my clients want to be sure up to maybe one millionth or one trillionth that when traffic goes off the bridge, it doesn't collapse. Now, in yes. that case, we are in a not good situation. We cannot say at all that there will not become a disaster soon, arrive a disaster soon. You see what I'm trying to say? The, yes, and the, I, the, the, yes. In legal terms, you have to say, do not start to speak from this side, but just start to speak from the other side. Uh, I, I've heard it being called, I've, I've, been, I've heard it being described as the burden of proof and where yeah. quite a lot of scientists um, uh, think that the burden of proof that uh, we're headed for societal collapse because of climate and environmental pressures uh, is on those people who wish to start preparing for such an eventuality um, rather than the burden of proof being on those who say no that's doomism um, and <laughs> And so, yeah, the precautionary principle, but also then just in, as you say, in engineering and construction is to, is to try and make sure <laughs> that things will not collapse. Um, the same uh, issue was 50 point. years ago about smoking. Uh, this, mm -hmm. the, the tobacco industry kept saying it is not been proved for 100% that tobacco causes cancer. No, the question should be the other way around. Is it safe to smoke? And finally, they lost, and it took 50 years, and we don't have 50 years for the climate. So, but we should move the burden of proof the other side, and that may help. Um, yes, that may help the good cause. Thank you, and thank you for that. And then, um, and thank you for inter interjecting and, and bringing, bringing us back to the, the question of models and the use of mathematics and such like. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I wanted to hear about your thoughts on, uh, which, which is now being recognized by psychologists as a, as a thing with a name, rightly or wrongly, eco-anxiety, climate anxiety. Some people have also called it eco-distress. Um, affecting people of all ages from young people to to the elderly and um and having all kinds of effects so for some it's a motivator and for other others 
it's not. And it seems to be like it's going to be a companion uh, for the people on this call and perhaps the people watching this video, a companion for the rest of our lives. Um, and increasingly so for other people who, who wake up to the climate crisis. So what's, where does, where do you think Buddhist philosophy and meditation, meditative practices come in on that? First, I would like to generalize the eco anxiety because we do not only have an eco crisis, we have a financial crisis, we have an energy crisis, we have a poverty crisis, or rather the balance of who has money and who doesn't is not equal. That's a definite crisis when eight people own as much as all the seven billion minus eight other people. That's so, mm. uh, so there are many crises. Uh, do you mind I speak about also, also about them? Absolutely. Uh, but people... I will not enter details. But <laughs> <laughs> Many people say that the climate crisis is the result of underlying uh, malfunctions in our society, which come about because underlying malfunctions or misunderstandings in our own psyche. You know, the, the, yeah. the we've, we've, all these are symptoms of deeper malaise. Right on because now I want to go to the even deeper uh, crisis, namely that life in general is a split. A split like a dancer, a female dancer can sit with one leg forwards and other leg uh, backwards. Maybe you have seen that in the theater. Mm -hmm. um, in Dutch, we call it um, spachat. Um, life is a split. Because on the one hand, we like to take care of ourselves. We have our hygiene, we collect food, we have shelter. And on the other hand, we are mortal. So that's a tremendous split. And many people have been writing about it and Nietzsche describes it as sitting on a tiger and we can be thrown off at any moment and we don't realize that we sit on a tiger. So we better, many people hide themselves from the truth. But Nietzsche didn't want to do that. Um, he said, I prefer to suffer uh, and look at the truth. And in some sense, Vipassana goes that way. We want to know the truth. But then there is an even more um, wider problem. Buddha solved the problem of the fear of death by meditation, but he solved a much bigger problem. Namely, we want to be always in control. And death is frightening because we are not in control of that. But we are not in control of so many more things. We may fall in love with someone and then that person doesn't want that one issue. But every day it happens that we encounter something in which we are not master of the things. And Vipassana teaches us to be at ease with that. To make a long story short, one stoa Epictetus said it already, give me the power to change what can be changed, give me the patience to undergo what cannot be changed, and give me the wisdom to distinguish those two. Yes. Yeah, so <clears throat> any, so uh, that that's helpful. So yes, in, in any life, there is the the ups and downs and the, the various different problems and we you, you started talking about all the different problems in the world inequality poverty financial crisis as well as environmental crisis but then there's the this ori original insurmountable uh stressful and a thing that we can be ang anxious about which is that we're alive and we know we're mortal we're going to die um and also that we we are we 
experience ourselves as separate and therefore insecure and wanting to control. And, and even if things all seem perfect, <laughs> we'd still have that problem. And, and um, Vipassana meditation helps bring a, a, attention to our inner worlds, our, no, the, the notion of, it, it also in, invites a different way of thinking about the nature of self um, and who we actually are. I was wondering if you could say something on that. Yeah, this, so first of all, very good summary you made. Uh, but now again, you jump a bit too much forward. You're mm -hmm. a very good student, so you know what's coming. I would like to intermit something. Um, the fact that we cannot control everything we like to control is very fundamental and it will happen every day. Um, and we have to learn to get in, in peace with that. We better are, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> Vipassana has two goals, namely, bring down the daily stress, concentration, serenity, that's the first one. And the second goal is insight, understanding the mechanisms of your own mind, of the mind of others, and mechanisms of the world. And that's for long-term or uh, renewable, sustainable uh, peace. So later I will describe, you mentioned it already in the introduction, I will describe basic exercise one, that's for concentration to get serene, and basic exercise two, to get insight. Now I come to your question, uh, self. We will get a different view on ourselves, on ourselves. We do exist, but we do not exist as a fixed entity that's once and for always like this, and it goes on in time, because then certainly we have a problem when we have to die, because what happens with this thing? But actually it happens every day when somebody denies something I, th I thought I had the right to. Also this fist has to collapse a bit. So this self will be seen not as static, but as dynamic. And when we really are at ease with the dynamic view of um, self, then we have released a big, big tension maker, stress maker. I do want to hear about those basic exercises just because I, I think you uh, it's really important, but I just want to say before we go to that, um, we would love to have questions from Deep Adaptation Forum participants. So please um, uh, do type your questions now into the chat box, um, and then um, and then um, I'll come to you in about five minutes if there are questions. So, so Hank. Um, yeah, I think for people who know Vipassana exists, um, but haven't done it, then telling us a little bit more about it, those two basic exercises would be, would be really helpful. Yes, and the first basic exercise you will find also in Zen and in all types, even in transcendental meditation. Uh, <clears throat> that is you choose a meditation object and we usually take the breath to be focused on. But you can choose something else, but let's keep it with this. Now by breath, we do not mean the actual oxygen that goes into you and goes down, because you cannot observe it. You observe the breath as you can observe it. And that's the belly that moves out and back. So we say rising, falling, or some people breathe a little bit higher, that's fine. 
the chest is rising and falling. So the breath is really the physical sensations of the body that are changing. So that's the object to be observing. Now you do that. Rising, falling, rising, falling. In the beginning, naming using words is useful because it keeps you with the exercise. But the name is just the name. When I say the taste of a mango, it's a particular taste. But the name is not so nice as the actual mango, you know that. So after you can follow it for some time, you try to do it nameless. Okay, and then you observe it. Now, the human mind is so flexible that after doing this two, three times, you're already busy with your shopping list or with your to-do list or with the book that you're writing. Many people feel ashamed at that moment. No need to feel ashamed. This is creativity in you. Um, nevertheless, for a few moments you were not, or maybe even for five minutes, you were not aware. That period is called ignorance. You do something and you do it even well without being aware. Remember driving in a city and you cross the bridge and you say, hey, I'm already at the other side of the Thames or whatever. And I didn't realize I was driving over the bridge, but you didn't make an accident, so you did it well. So one of the things is we like to have less moments of ignorance. You know why? Because in these teeny moments, we make important decisions. And if in these teeny moments there is desire or aversion that we don't even know, we may become um, a racist or we may uh, buy the wrong car, house or, or whatever. So... Destroy the whole biosphere. Right. Yeah, because there are a lot of ignorance ignorances in there. Now, what do we do when we realize, oh, shopping list. So then you smile, you relax, and you return. I repeat. So basic exercise one is following the object. Then for sure you will get sidetracked. And when you realize that, develop a friendly attitude. Oh yes, and you go back. So each time when it happens, to be sidetracked has a bonus. And the bonus is you develop a little bit more friendliness, general friendliness towards yourself, towards others and the world. So that's useful, that has to be used. And then you repeat ad infinitum. So you practice this and I'm not in favor of practicing. Um, I, I like to go to retreats. When you do this for a week or 10 days, you gain so much power that is hardly gainable when you do every day, half an hour at home. Other people, other teachers says, well, meditate at least five minutes even if when you're sitting on the toilet, because five minutes of being aware is a gain. So actually I do that also, but you can do both, but I would advertise retreating. You, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> now, All right. um, this calms you down, basic exercise one, because you get more and more focused on, on the object. Then comes basic exercise two, which is typical for Vipassana. You observe the breathing. It's very similar to basic exercise one. It's even easier than basic exercise one. You get sidetracked, you don't know it yet. You're still ignorant. And then, oh, shopping list. Or, oh, bad mood 
I was in this morning. And then you re-smile, relax, and return. I repeat. So the only difference is that now you put your attention for a few moments, basically, let's say one, two seconds, to the visitor that was visiting you and taking you away from the meditation object. And then you will see that you have many visitors. That's all right. One student said, I have 1,001 visitors. Well, you put them all in one bag and then that big bag is your big visitor and you put it. You, don't, you cannot destroy the bag. You put it in the refrigerator and deal with it later, one by one preferably. And you can go back to your breath. This is the basic two exercises. What I found really helpful was when you uh, distinguished between, um, on the one hand, an experience or a thought that would be pleasant or unpleasant, and what might be wholesome or unwholesome, mm. and how we might assume that something pleasant is wholesome and something unpleasant is unwholesome, and and to actually bring attention to, to that and not assume that. Um, I found it very useful to bring attention to what was happening in my mind with all those visitors and um, and also how much of my mental chatter and ramblings was um, be because I was averse to something or craving something. But also after Vipassana in normal, so-called normal life, um, I, it helped me understand um, how I how I am in the world when I read something on an email or in the news or I meet someone and have a conversation just to, um, yeah, notice, noticing is that pleasant, is that idea pleasant, unpleasant? It, um, do I have any aversion to it or desire towards it? Um, and so it's been, that's why I said earlier, I think it's, it's almost like Vipassana uh, could be compulsory for anyone doing any scholarly work so they better understand what's going on inside their heads. <laughs> mindfulness training of eight weeks is kind of the beginning of vipassana and they do it now in elementary schools in in the united states uh, in in italy and our people so what you're referring to is the classification of visitors and one very important visitor is the feeling tone of what comes to us some things that come to us are pleasant and other things are unpleasant. And we, meditators, should be like botanists, biologists, that describe everything that comes. So, flower, nice smell, a rose. So you write in your book, a rose has a nice smell, put it away. Mushroom, stinky, put it away. You write in your book, stinky. So with this care, you look to all your visitors. That will help a lot. Then you described, you were a very good student last year, Jim. Uh, you described the distinction between pleasant and wholesome. Pleasant and unpleasant is brought in by nature as a reward system for our behavior. So um, food and sex is pleasant because nature wants us to be strong and to multiply, uh, to make a long story short, right? And um, we are conditioned by this, but it's not always wholesome. The hedonist mistake, and we are all hedonists, the hedonist mistake is to identify pleasant with wholesome. Then there are the Calvinists, and in Holland we have a lot of Calvinists, and a little bit, each of us is a bit a Calvinist, that thinks that unpleasant is wholesome because that purifies the soul. That's also Thanks for reminding us of that, <laughs> yeah. That's also not the case. Yeah. Hatred, for example, is unpleasant, but it's also unwholesome. Mm. 
but this turn can be unpleasant. And now come back to the topic of climate uh, crisis. This turn for the climate is unpleasant, but when you do it in an equanimous way, um, it is wholesome. So pleasant and wholesome overlap. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, those mathematical drawings of overlapping sets, the so-called Venn diagram. Definitely, and, and for me that, that has been my motivation with the deep adaptation conversation is to help people uh, face something which is unpleasant, which is, um, but, but to try to find um, wholesome ways of engaging in it. Um, I want to go to questions now. Um, so I just want to say again, um, I don't know why this is. Is this cultural or is it accidental? But we often have more questions from 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 men than women on these calls. So uh, please, if you're if you do consider to um, ask a question of, of of Hank. But our first question, having said that, is Terry. Uh, over to you um, and your your question. So there you go. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ver Ver I'm bad at pronouncing names, I'm sorry. Uh, Hank, thank you very much for this morning. I'm enjoying, enjoying this immensely. I guess I'm veering a little to the um, analytic left brain side of the conversation, but I just wanted to ask, it seems obvious to me many times that science and technology as we know them, as they've come out of the modern era into the contemporary world, they seem to have played, I would say, say root causal roles if not at least catalytic roles in bringing us into the crises we're facing for example four cycles of industrial revolution driven by science so my question is to what extent if that's true to what extent is it really even reasonable to think of science as the pinnacle of rationality having brought us to this outcome because we're certainly not in a rational place it seems so that's kind of my question. To what extent are modern and contemporary science and technology even barely rational in light of the crises that they've at least contributed to? It's a philosophy well, science question, I guess. Thank you. Terry, thank you for your question. The point is that Homo sapiens, he or she is not rational. He or she has some rationality, but has also impulses that are much bigger than the ratio in many cases. As a scientist and a mathematician, you have to develop the rationality and the intuition, but also the rationality to, to overcome your greediness to prove a certain thing that you like to be true. So that's the first thing. Then with successful science and mathematics, we build tools, but then the unwise human beings make use of the tools in order to control nature. But control is always limited. There can be legal uh, limitations, ethical limitations, ecological limitations, financial limitations, and some things are sheer impossible. So we have to learn that some things are not controllable. And when we have learned it, then we can change. But it's not an easy task. And I'm very happy that you gathered together to support this uh, deep adaptation that we need to understand this as a human race. Thank you. Yeah, within the Deep Adaptation Forum, there's a, there's a, a discussion group on philosophy. So there are a number of discussion groups on all kinds of areas, food and agriculture, therapeutic practices, government policy, education, but also there's one on, on philosophy and, and Terry's but, engaged but you in that. You have to feel it in your marrow and bone. Uh, yes, I, 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 I mean, you can ration, I think even many politicians know rationally that we should do this, but then still they do that because in their bones, they want to be reelected. That's a disadvantage of democracy. Um, not that I'm in favor of another form, but we have to realize that. So Hank, on that issue, it, it's, um, 
earlier this year, I read the Tao Te Ching for the first time in my life, and I'm 47 years old, and it was like, I can't believe I've got to this stage in my life and I haven't read this. And it's also how I felt about your Vipassana retreat last year. And so I'm wondering, how, how do we, should we be concerned or interested in how to spread awareness of this philosophy and these practices? Um, or, or is that not a wise way of, of being right now? Um, because there is, we, we have economic systems and political systems, like you've just said, which uh, seem to be pushing us in the wrong directions. Um, and, and yet it's very clear to you and many other people uh, that there's another way of being. There's another way of experiencing self and other and world and universe. Um, yeah, so looking around, it seems like there's so much of those moments of ignorance. Just, what, what, what should we do? What, yeah. what short remark on the Tao Te Ching and on meditation and Buddhism. Lao Tse was on the same level as Buddha, but he di di didn't tell how he reached that level. But he did something else. He described how one should rule a country with that state of mind. Buddha, on the other hand, he had an algorithm to reach the state of serenity and the um, sustainable serenity, but he didn't say what you have to do then. He said, enjoy your life. But Lao Tse, so together they are very powerful. And that's why in China, uh, Buddhism and uh, Taoism came together and fused to Chan, the Buddhist form of meditation that later became Zen. Now, this was just the introduction of what you said. Now your question is what, you know, what is your question? We should learn from this, right? Um, no, my question is, um, you, you'd mentioned, and it's, it's difficult to not criticize politics, economics, modernity, um, because it's what's causing so many of the problems. And so um, there's this incredible wisdom, as well as the, the algorithms you mentioned, algorithm of, of, of meditation. And uh, is it... it is it a valid conversation for us to have? How do we help people become aware of this philosophy and these practices in pursuit of not just trying to help them in their own suffering, but actually to have some sort of collective, almost political impact through spreading these ideas and practices? I would go to education, start at young age to make children realize that they have a mind state. An Italian colleague, he teaches three-year-olds. And you may think that mind state is one of the visitors, by the way, one of the five types of visitors. And you may think that it's quite abstract for a little child to understand what is a mind state. No, little John was angry. And the teacher said, ah, little John, you have an angry mind state. Later he was happy. You have a happy mind state. So little John knew what mind states were. Three years old. He came home. He did something naughty. His mother was angry. Mom, you're having an angry mind state. The mother was flabbergasted and asked where he learned it. And he said at mindfulness in school. And the mother is now also taking mindfulness. So that should happen more. Or yes. may that happen more. I mean, I should not say should, but may that happen more. And can I just pick up on that? You say, may that happen more, not a should, because there's a, you have a, you, you stay away from ideas of either obligation or impact at scale. Is that right? There's um, sort of a deep acceptance in you. Is that what, why no, you say actually, that? Yeah, that's a good, good point. Very good point. In my heart, I would say this should happen more, but the whole theory of meditation is that you should not, you better not enforce things because that is not going to work. But 
the deep wish is that this happens more and I'm giving retreats or online retreats at the end of October there will be another online retreat which cost a bit usually my retreats online cost only two euros for the contribution to zoom so and um, and and the rest is uh, generosity so I'm willing to do it for you for uh, wonderful for, yeah for, I'll um, I'll group. put in links at the in the um, both in the event page but also at the bottom of the YouTube video so everyone here you can you can follow up with Hank if you're interested or tell people and friends colleagues and three-year-olds you know no you haven't you haven't worked that one out for three-year-olds yet Hank maybe <laughs> but the, the British Parliament recognizes mindfulness now there was a big okay. report on that so I see that's good news I, I think that's one of the few parliaments that was so wise they didn't act to that last year but anyway uh -huh. uh, they have that um, belief in mindfulness. I so see. So we're going to have to have a bigger population si size, uh, sample size, because at, at the moment that's, that's <laughs> not proving statistically useful, uh, positive outcomes. So um, I wondered, Hank, we've only got a few minutes. And so are there things that you think are really might be useful to share, could be useful to share for uh, people in the deep adaptation community. So this is a community of people who want to stay compassionately active, creative in the face of societal collapse, whenever that may come. And of course, in some parts of the world, it's happening already. Um, yeah, are there any thoughts before we, we part? I would suggest that you, but also your sister, um, your sister, how should I call it, uh, group, uh, uh, what was the name? Um, Extinction uh, Rebellion. That they oh, have right. so-called laws. And the laws are advices to the world. If you behave according to that, then things will go better. Not that you have the legal support for it, but it's something like the human, um, the Helsinki uh, Human Rights Declaration. And maybe later, countries will follow it. If you have a list of readable, well-formulated laws that are good for the Extinction Rebellion, but now back to you, I keep forgetting those were deep adaptation. Um, there are also, could be slogans, uh, like Shaila Kasserine, a good American teacher of Vipassana, she calls it uh, focused and fearless. So we have to have easy sounding deep words for this to grow. So I'm, I'm being now a PR person here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one thing to advise then education. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. I'm happy to join you in another uh, configuration to, to make more plans, but let's start with these two also due to time. Right. Thank you. There's a narrative and messaging group uh, in the Deep Adaptation Forum, so I'll, I'll uh, put a link into this and say at the end, invitation to, to have deep and powerful slogans which uh, people can relate to quickly. I'll um, give it some thought as well. Um, any, I, any other comments? Otherwise, we've, we've come up to the hour. And um, so it's otherwise it's 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 time to say goodbye. Okay, so good. Thank you very much, um, Hank, indeed. And I really look forward to either well, hopefully in person one day, um, and prior to that, then online experiencing your vipassana uh, once again. So thank you everyone for joining and. Um, I wish you Thank well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.